Our last speaker is a treat because he's a very gifted speaker and he's doing many different things at the same time. We first met him in, uh, in Daba conference in South Africa where he was invited by Ravi to be the MC. So we suddenly saw this person on stage which is uh, originally from Belgium but lives in the Netherlands and has this incredible uh, way of introducing people, of entertaining the room, of bringing everybody together and so on. And we have become friends um, ever since here and there meeting each other in, uh, recently in the Dutch Design Week. And uh, it's with great pleasure that I um, ask you to really be very, very uh, uh, great listeners to this uh, new message about new materials for our world. Lucas? Hello, everybody. Um, I'm so glad that everybody took the time to come here all day. It's a quite some, um, quite an effort that you have to give. I'm trying to open the full screen at the same time. Yeah, we can, can you see it. Yeah, we can see it just now. Yes. And then we'll start like this. Okay. Um, so hello, everybody. My name is Lucas. Uh, you're almost done with today. One more Belgian and then we go to Lee. So keep hanging in there. Um, I'm not a fashion designer. I don't know anything about textile, a little bit about love and life. So I'm going to talk about that. Um, welcome. My name is Lucas de Man, the man. Uh, it's my real name. It's not an artist name, Lucas de Man. Um, I'm the director of company New Heroes and of company Biobase Creations. I'm a TV host in the Netherlands doing art shows, uh, a theater. I'm actually many things at the same time. I think like a lot of us, we are many things. So when my uncle at Christmas asked what I do, a little bit drunk and also already with this idea of he's an artist, what does that mean? I always say that I'm a creator. That means that I professionally create, that I make my living by being creative. And that's actually the main reason why I want to talk with you. I think most of you here are creatives. It's not because you do a creative business that you are creative, by the way. Being creative is a mindset. Um, my two organizations, I have Company New Heroes. We call ourselves a professionally creative company. Uh, we take actual topics and then we create projects. We try to do some storytelling towards an audience. We always work with different creative people from all over the world. Um, in the storytelling, that means that we make installations, performances, books, podcasts, whatever is needed to bring over the story that we want to share with an audience. Some examples so that you get an idea of what we do. A project that we've been working on currently is In Search of Democracy 3.0. Uh, we started our democracy, as to say, in Greece, 500 before Christ. First of all, that's not true. It's not that one Greek woke up one day with an apple on his head thinking, oh my God, let's do some democracy. Um, we traced that back because, of course, it's a Western idea to think that we brought democracy to the world and then we will bring it everywhere for example, to Syria, eh? we are introducing this concept of civilization to the barbarians. That's the idea that a lot of Western people have. And then it turned out that Western democracy actually started in Syria, uh, 3000 before Christ. I really love how history has always been very ironic to the people who think they invented it. So it's great. Um, what we do is actually 3.0. That means that we have to rethink what democracy is because we are losing it a little bit. We do live shows, we, docu we do documentaries, um, we do actually do projects with civil servants, people that are running cities here in Holland to make sure that they rethink what democracy can be, always with examples of what could be true. We never know what the truth is, but we always give examples. Another project that is very close to my heart is Yes, Please. It's a project about erotic fantasies. And I see some of you, Karen Lucas raised hands. Okay, Karen, did you just raise your hand to wave or because you have a question or can't you hear me? She can't hear you, but it's okay. Uh, many people rose their hands. Just, I'm gonna raise my hand right back to you as well. Hello everybody. And I am gonna continue then. The erotic fantasies uh, project is that um, we wanted to ask people and we did over 300 people. We asked them, what is your erotic fantasy? Why? Not because we are so into sex, which we also are, but because we believe in vulnerability. I think we live in a world that is all about, you can make 
it your own. You can perfectionize the world around you. You have control over everything, which is bullshit. It's idiot. You don't have control over the world. You know, you only have control over a little bit and the rest just will happen to you. So that means that you are, we are way more humble than, uh, than that. And what I like about erotic fantasy, sex, you can control, you can, the way you look, try to be as beautiful as you want on social media. But with erotic fantasies, they are there. You cannot choose what tickles you. You cannot choose what fantasies come up in your head. So it makes you human, it makes you vulnerable. So I wanted to do a project about it. We made a book, an expo, live shows, and so on. We interview people live on stage about erotic fantasies. We collected more than 300 of them. And of course, the result is there is no normal. I love it when the result of a project is there's no standard, there's no normal. We are all completely uh, different. And in that difference, we're all the same, which means not. Another project is Meet the Millennials. We went to Asia, East Asia, to be more precise. We were interviewing their millennials, people under 40, that are changing the world. Uh, East Asia is going so fast, we wanted to understand what does virtual love means, what does robotic means, what does DNA editing mean in our lives of today. And we made, again, a show, documentaries, book, and so on, and so on. We also do installations. For example, this is See Me in Dutch, Zime. This was a huge, or this still is a huge hospital. And that building, we put all the windows out and only the text See Me because of the people that work in uh, uh, care and in health often are disregarded and we wanted to give them the view. So everywhere in Rotterdam, this is the city of Rotterdam, where you were walking, you could see the hospital screaming, please look at me, see me for who I really am and for what I'm doing. Um, and then finally, within New Heroes, the I project, we did that in Den Bosch, also the place from where the forum is being uh, uh, sent out, broadcasted. These are eyes, we were hanging them on building, you could sit in a chair, the chair was pushed outside of the building, you were just hanging in the air, watching through the eye, and through the eye you could see the city, right? And then at a certain moment, the eye closed, then you saw this beautiful animation of trying to find your place in a city. The city itself can be anonymous, but the city is made up out of people and people have emotions, feelings, or searching, so are you. So we made those cities into people. You could see a whole journey and then the eye opened again and you saw the city through a different light. And the idea comes from, let's look behind the eyes and not only stay in front of it. So we had five of those hanging on buildings in different cities. People could sit in them and just have a moment to reflect on themselves, looking behind their own eyes in the end. Well, these are projects that we are doing. Uh, the other company that I started two years ago is called Biobase Creations. And the, um, we started it because as, as an artist and together with a lot of people that we work, we are very polluting because <laughs> we are creating sets and we're creating installations. And after a few years, you don't need them anymore. So you just throw them away or dismantle them. So we were not happy with ourselves. Uh, because we were polluting too much, we said, let's do some research into new materials so that we can build sets, for example, that go back to nature or that are way closer to nature. And that brought us to a beautiful time where we did research, for example, for this project with mycelium. Uh, and then we discovered that there's a whole world out there that is trying to find new materials for the building world, for the more sustainable cities. So we dove into that with biobased creations bringing storytelling and imagination to the world of biobased. I'll show you the project we did last year. It's called the Growing Pavilion. And the idea was let's make a pavilion, a small house that is as biobased as possible. And biobased, we mean grown from nature products, products from nature that can actually go back to nature. And what you see on the right is uh, panels made from mycelium that turned out like this. So this is the real pavilion. And the, the outside wall, the facade, is made out of mycelium panels. And for those who are like, oh, what is mycelium again? Mycelium are the roots of mushroom underground. And the, those mushrooms, they look very cute, you know, but underground, their roots connect into these beautiful networks called mycelium. It grows extremely fast. So what you do is you take some hemp, for example, or some uh, cattail, a dried, it could also be the residue, you put it together, you put a little bit of mushroom uh, mycelium into it. After one week, it grows into a panel like this. Then for one week, you dry it just on 40 degrees Celsius. You don't have to overheat it too much. And then you have these beautiful panels. 
And the funny thing was, it was never used outside. It was it is used in the packaging industry a little bit. It was used in the insulation industry a little bit, and always it looked it looked white, completely white. And we were like, why? The beauty of the mushroom. Let's show all these different colors. So Pascal, the book, our designer, decided to work with mycelium experts on making outside panels, and those shapes we put them in because you can make it any form you want because you have more. So we show the organic shapes with the colors is because you play a little bit when, when you stop the mushroom from growing. And we had an organic coating so that the whole pavilion has this beautiful outside look and it's, it's still there. It's now in Almere, so it's still alive and working. And the bench you see there, the beautiful bench is made out of rice straw, so the residue of rice. The roof was made out of cotton. This is the inside. The great thing with mycelium is it's insulating also acoustically and it breathes. So the air quality in this pavilion is three times better than in any average building. And the rain could come from down the roof up to the plants and then under the pavilion goes away again. And then finally, to make it complete the story, the floor was made out of burlap and potato starch uh, and cattail residue. So completely plant-based floor as well. Now, we really liked it. Um, we got a lot of rewards and, 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 and praise for the pavilion. We worked very hard on it as well, but it's so huge that you cannot easily transport it and only six designers worked on it. And then we got so many questions from designers, from people who worked years on one product, like, please help us show the world that we can think differently, not only in materials, but also in waste streams and also in uh, building techniques. So this year, one week ago, we premiered a new project called The Exploded View. I want to show it to you. Am I excited? Of course I am. The Exploded View is a house, just a standard house, two bedrooms, kitchen, bathroom, floor, and whatever. We pulled it apart. Every room got different materials in their ceiling, so on, from nature. I'll show you. I'll show you. This is the uh, Exploded View as it is placed at the Dutch Design Week in this beautiful, old, completely half torn down building. And uh, I'll show you a few of the rooms. On the front here, this is the main building that we have. On the front, the red tiles is the kitchen. Uh, the red tiles are made of casein, which is milk protein. So in Holland, we have more milk than people. We have more cows. We have, we throw away our milk. We have milk parties and still we have too much milk, right? And so what we do with the milk, we just throw it away. But if you don't throw it away and you sort of uh, dissect it, you have the milk protein that you can use to build balls. The ball on the left downstairs is also casein and the red tiles are with a little bit of seder together. And then behind the tiles, you see a popcorn wall. So the whole kitchen, we have an egg floor, popcorn wall. The idea is food waste can be used into materials. The blue tiles next to the red casein tiles on the top there are made from algae and chalk. Under there is algae and reed. And on the right, you see the black tiles. They are made from seaweed. So you can make from beautiful plant products, water products, and food products. You can make building materials. Here, you see some close-ups. Uh, on the right top, this wall, this wall is made out of mussels, the mussels from Holland. So fractioned mussels together with burlap and potato starch. You have tiles from mussels. This is uh, uh, upstairs, so you see the kitchen, and then the upstairs room is so beautiful, I want to show you a close one. This is from the fashion industry, so there is a little bit of fashion in our project. This is textile made 100% from algae and then naturally dyed. So this, this whole beautiful, I go back, you see this whole beautiful uh, uh, wallpaper, actually you can hang it as a wall room divider, as on the walls, is completely made out of algae, and algae are that's say the product of the future. They are little animals, plant-based animals. They can do so much better for the environment that we have. This is our toilet. You always have to show a toilet when people are coming to your house. This is printed, 3D printed locally, 3D printed, completely made out of the waste product from the sewage water. So imagine you're sitting on your toilet, right? You're flushing the toilet. You then we take the water, the water goes away, the residue that is in all the nutrients in the water of actually the, the sewage water, so toilet paper and whatever you have there, actually we take that, we put a little bit of uh, algae in it, and then we 3, 3, 3D print with that residue a toilet or whatever you want. So this toilet is printed from the sewage water from the toilet. 
This bedroom, uh, Samira Bon, she's amazing. This bedroom is made completely out of plants, residues, uh, out of bio-based plastic. So this, this whole bedroom is plant-based. It's acoustically amazing because of the origami shape. And the cool thing is you can take down the ceiling and the walls in two seconds or hang them up again. So the idea is that we have rooms that are temporary, that are healthy. And if you don't need them anymore, you go away again. Throw this in nature, it dissolves. So the whole, whole I'm not going to show every detail. If you want, you can go to the explodedview.com. What I really like about this project is that our designer, Pascal Le Book, worked with 40 different small studios, designers, producers to show the people how many great uh, products there are made from waste, residues, and so on. And we have a whole room that you see in the back made from textile waste, uh, jeans, and so on. And, and what we want to do is we show that it exists. We show that it can be done on a bigger scale. And on our website, we also still ask questions like we still need help in this, or we still don't know this, we still don't know here. And the idea is this year, we have a one in four scale. Next year, we're going to do one in one scale because we have to amp up the game when it comes to sustainable building. We have to amp up the materials, the building techniques. We have to work together. And what I really like is the fashion industry, the art industry, the building industry, the agricultural industry, they all work together to create our future world. Voila, these are a few of my projects. Now the big question is, why do you do this, Lucas? Why? I worked with all the funny things that you have with PowerPoint. I love this one. It's going to go. There we go. Why? You know? And the main reason is because some people ask me, don't you have a social life, Lucas? No, no, no. It's not because my friends don't want me. I mean, I have friends, but I am a creator. You know? I cannot not create. And I think that is very important. You know? If I would just think about money in a profit-driven economy that we are here, I won't do this. You know? I, will, I would just go for money. Why do I do these projects? Half of the time, they stress me out. Uh, they, this is only the project that works. We also have a lot of projects that never came to life, you know? Why? Because I'm a creator, you know? In me, it is there to create. And because I've, I have a philosophy, I want to share this philosophy with you. Now, my philosophy is I don't know. And this is very important. I don't know what is good in life, what is true, what the essence is, why we are here on this planet. I have no idea, but the great thing is nobody knows, right? Nobody knows why we are here on this planet and what the essence of life is. I mean, people have ideas. That's why we have religion. And that's why we have, for example, racism and things like that. People have ideas, but there's no one who ever solved the mystery of life. That's what makes us humans. Look, people are 99% animals, right? If you look at us the way we eat, fornicate, cheat on each other and so on, we are animals, let's agree. But we also algorithms. Huh? Look at Facebook knows more about us than we know about ourselves because we are predictable. The only thing what makes it difficult that we can't predict ourselves because, because we overthink things. But you know, algorithms know that we people are very predictable. Let's say 99% animal, 99% algorithm. The 1% that makes us human is that we don't know the essence, but we know that we don't know, right? An animal just has no idea. It just, you know, walks, eats, feels things, you know, sniffs certain things and, and itself and then stops. An algorithm doesn't need to know because it thinks I know. An algorithm knows. People know that they don't know. And that's what makes it so difficult being a person realizing that you will never completely understand why you're here. That's why we look at each other. That's why we come together to, to share the fact that we have no idea. That's why I like the sentence, I don't know, therefore I am, instead of Je, I, I think, therefore I am. An animal thinks, a plant thinks, a human thinks, plus knows that he doesn't know. That makes us human. At the same time, Stephen Hawking, you know, the guy from The Simpsons, he said there's no beginning of all. So he was the first scientist ever to prove that there is no one truth. So philosophy knew that already for 2,500 years. And then science knew, knows it now for, let's say, 25 years. There's no one truth. This makes a lot of people afraid. And what you see in these times of crisis is that people either go for conservative, you know, we have to stay the way we are, or go creative and find new solutions, but they're drifting apart. So I am predicting a growing inequality and a growing fear. The coming years 
the coming years. And that's why it's so important for the creators, the 600 people that are now watching, you know, the creative people. Why are we important? Not because we are better than anyone else. Trust me, we are not. But because we are the only professional that doesn't sell anything else than the story. Even when we sell a product, it's about the story. So we don't want you as a politician to vote for us. We don't want to make as much profit as possible. We don't want to let you believe in anything else than the searching. That's what I like about creators. All the people that share their presentations, you know, they are all searching and show that search, share that search with other people. The only way they make money is say, look, I'm searching, I'm trying something. What about this? You know, so a creator, it's not about making money as an end goal. It's about the story and sharing that story. And the story comes from search. I believe that the creator makes space for people to share the not knowing with themselves, others, or the world. So what we do, whether it's in our products or in our events or whatever that creators try to create, I call it a space for people to share that searching, that not knowing, which is essential. Because if you can't search the fact that you don't know and that you're looking for it, you get racism, you get loneliness, you get burnouts. The fact that you can share what we do now in the Hope Forum, we share the fact that we don't know. And we share, we share it in enthusiasm and our projects, but we have no end goal. So for me, having a space where you can be human is having a space where you can search together without ever finding one final answer. And as long as you can keep searching together and share that search, then actually you can be human and then there's hope. Thank you so much.